Please rise for silent prayer. Blessed Sabbath, we'll open our uh, divine service with hymn number 26. Hymn number 26. We praise thee, O God. Open our Bibles. Our key text. It's in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way. And the forward mouth do I hate. With those thoughts in our mind, we'll kneel down for opening prayer. Heavenly merciful Father, we are thankful for this beautiful day. We are thankful for this opportunity that we could be here together, that we could encourage each other, that we could learn something new, that we could share something good with each other. Oh Lord, we are thankful for your protection and guidance. We are thankful for Jesus Christ our Savior. O oh Lord, we are asking you that you are with us, that you help us, that you lead us, that you are a speaker this hour. We are asking you a special prayer for our young people. Please help them and lead them, because like we study in the lessons, Satan knows he doesn't have much time, and he knows how important it is to Lord young heart. O Lord, we are asking you that with us, that you are merciful for us. We are asking you that you forget us on sins and our shortcomings, and please be with us and help us in everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
like to welcome you all for this uh, divine service. Um, it is beautiful day outside. And it is a beautiful opportunity to be inside too. Uh, we have few announcements for today. Uh, right after the lunch will be our, after divine service will be our uh, fellowship lunch. And we'll have, uh, everybody is invited. We have our prayer meeting on every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, today after the, the lunch will be orchestra practice and, and a choir practice. So who is involved, uh, who participate, please uh, after lunch will be practices. Uh, for, next, for next Sabbath, we'll have special offering. Uh, they building orphanage home in Kenya. So uh, for next Sabbath, we will collect offering to help with the building of that project. Uh, for next, uh, like week for tomorrow, June 16, uh, we'll have a business meeting here at the morning at uh, 10 a.m. in the church. And after the, the business meeting, we'll have a church cleaning before the conference, so please, all members and, and friends and visitors who, who are willing to help, please come. Usually when we do work here, it is nice together. We, we could uh, talk together, we could help each other. It's just such a pleasant atmosphere and such a nice experience. And we're planning some uh, activities for, uh, for our uh, young people, especially maybe for more even for the boys. We try to build some picnic tables. So please, uh, if you if you like to help with that, please come and join us. Uh, we got um, kitchen. Uh, for the kitchen announcements, you could, uh, you could read through here, it's in the bulletin. Uh, more or less, we asking the people who are in the kitchen to not work in the kitchen during the divine service. And we asking everybody else to be patient after the divine service. You don't have to run right away to the kitchen and ask for the food. We could talk a little bit together. We could spend time together. And when they will be ready, we could enjoy the lunch together. We have our conference. Uh, it's uh, two weeks from now, so please pray for it. It is a special day. It's a special opportunity, so please pray for it. And we have to prepare our hearts for it. And we have uh, announced about uh, carpet cleaning. Uh, replacement and uh, it's very good news we, we collected over 8,000 so it's a uh, it's, it's good project and and uh, we almost there so almost there so I uh, like to thank everybody who helped with that and now we could invite our ushers and we'll collect uh, the one service of them
Thank you all. May God bless gift and the givers. Instead of the, our second hymn, we'll have a special item. Thank you, Bianca and Marta, for this beautiful song. And now we invite uh, Brother Walter, and he will deliver a sermon, the title, Love God, Hate Evil. Dalibor mentioned love God, hate evil, and it's love good, hate evil, but there was no mistake because God and good is the same thing. What did Jesus say when somebody addressed him, good master? He said, there is, why you call me good? There is only one good and this is God. So love God or love good is the same thing and hate evil. I welcome you all here this morning, those who are regularly with us and those who are not so often with us. Jeremy, Jerome, you're welcome. 
My brother is visiting for two weeks. I'm happy that he is with us and other brethren who are here as with us. Today I'd like to share with you a topic that is uh, not as strange to you. You will quickly connect with it. And because I spoke about this topic in the past, and I believe it will be interesting for young and old, you will be easily able to connect with the contemporary issues as we go from the cosmic conflict to that what is going on here on Earth. Now, some of you have paid close attention to some sermons that I presented here a few weeks ago about the great controversy. Today I'd like to talk about the great controversy but in the context of the battle that is going on here on Earth and how each one of us is involved in that battle and what kind of impact or contribution we make to the great controversy. Let me read a text from the book of Revelation that I have quoted here before. It's in chapter 12, verses 7 to 9 and verse 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In the Sabbath school we had, in the new lesson, we had this enemy mentioned first. That is our greatest adversary, because the name the name Satan, the word Satan means adversary, opponent. And look at, the verse, uh, look at the verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. We mentioned this also in the Sabbath school today why we feel the intensity of the battle today so much. Why we all feel that we are like in a whirlwind. There is so much pressure. Today, even traveling here to the church, my brother said, look, you in Toronto, you drive a little bit differently than people drive in the countryside or in some other parts of the world. I can see that there is more dynamics, how cars move, you know, and uh, people are uh, tense. But this is just a reflection of something that is going inside. We are tense inside. The lifestyle, the amount of information we receive from different sources, the business activities, and all daily activities, everything is putting an enormous pressure on us. But there is a spiritual battle going behind the scene. We studied also that, about spiritual battle going in our mind and souls. And that is, brethren, because Satan knows he has very short time. And we know what will happen when God's people will be sealed. What will happen with the great controversy? It will be over. Revelation 7. What does it say? I will not read it now. I will paraphrase. I saw four angels standing on the four corners holding the four winds. Four angels, four corners, four winds. Holding the winds. The winds should not blow anywhere. Until when? Until the people of God are sealed in their foreheads. And then the winds are released. Seven last plagues. God's judgment come upon the earth. Satan's time is over. So he knows that as long as he keeps us busy and preoccupied with worldly things and not focused on God, not developing character, not bringing the great controversy to the end, he has extra time. He's buying time by keeping us away from God, by keeping us away from the Christian perfection and the character development. But today I'd like to focus on this battle uh, in that we see also in the society. 
Maybe next time I'll talk about spiritual world church more specifically. Today I'd like to talk about society. But let us see what is behind this battle. Let me read first a quote from the Great Controversy, page 569. And by the way, before I read this quote, we had a board meeting and we discussed a little bit the order in the church and during the worship service. Some brethren who, for valid reasons, need to be in the dining area told us that there is sometimes noise in the dining area. And we are wondering why there is a noise in the dining area. Why anyone should be in the dining area or common areas when there is a worship service going on here. We come to this church primarily to hear the word of God. This is why we are here. Food and fellowship is secondary. The word of God is primary. This is why we are here. I mean, if there is sometimes reasons we have to go whatever, but I mean, brethren, please understand why we come to church. This is life and death issues, brethren. This is sick. We studied today if our eyes could be open and see the spiritual side of the battle, the forces of a good and evil, we would so much, you know, heed the word of God. Every word put in the heart through prayer, to meditation, because the time is very serious. Look at this, what is Satan doing in the world? Let me read the quote, Great Contrary, page 569. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin. At the same time, he causes them to cherish false conceptions of God so that they regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the creator. It is embodied in systems of religion and expressed in modes of worship, this false concept of God. Thus the minds of men are blinded and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. By perverted conceptions of the divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe Human sacrifices are necessary to secure the favor of deity. And horrible cruelties have been perpetrated under the various forms of idolatry. So you see, brethren, what happened when character of God is misrepresented in the nature of God's government? You don't have to go far to see how well and alive is this approach to God. You just can go to internet and to YouTube and you can find atheists who are attacking the God of heaven and the Christian religion and the Bible. And I can tell you the names. Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, the late Christopher Hitchens, evolutionist Richard Dawkins, militant, virulent atheist, hating God, spitting venom. I can just quote, paraphrase Hitchens. He said, well, I don't, I hate. He wrote a book, God is not great. And he is attacking the Bible. He says, I hate this heavenly celestial dictatorship. He wants to control your life. What you do with your, your life. Who do you marry? How you marry? What do you eat? Which day you keep, you know, or don't keep as a sacred day? Everything is controlled. He wants to have full control over you. And even when you die, you are not free. He is bringing you to judgment. Just listen. There are people who hate God. And they are very popular. There are people who are in academia, who are in the media, who are often in the government. Venomous hatred, misrepresenting God. Why there is evil in the world? You know that argument against God. So here we are to defend God's government. And to truly represent who God is, Satan attributes his characteristics to God. He's projecting his own evil attributes to God. And this is why people, so the world today has, there is a misapprehension of God's character. Now I read the next quote, Patriarchs and Prophets. You see, Sister White, 
by divine inspiration, she was shown that she knows exactly what's going on. Page 69. From the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was unjust, that his law was faulty, and that the good of the universe required to, it to be changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its author. In the controversy, it was uh, to be shown that whether the divine statutes were defective and subject to change or perfect and immutable. Brothers and sisters, I can see more and more clearly that the law of God is in issue. You can go anywhere. People who are secular and humanist, they don't want to surrender to divine authority. I'm telling you, that's the problem. They don't want someone to be above them. Our reason is sufficient to tell us what is right and wrong. That's the argument. Unfortunately, some people even claim to be Christians who believe like that. Next one, Great Controversy 193. Counterfeit holiness, spurious sanctification is still doing its work of deception among the Christians. Under the various forms, it exhibits the same spirit in the days of Luther, diverting minds from the scriptures and leading men to follow their own feelings and impressions rather than to yield obedience to the law of God. This is one of Satan's most successful devices to cast reproach upon purity and truth. So what are people doing? They are not going by the word of God and the law of God, but they are going by their own feelings. And I will speak about that today, going by heart. And you will see how it works. Next one, Desire of Ages, 761. Emotional religion, right? Excitement. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. See? Law cannot be kept. This is what he claimed. And then when people trans or intelligent beings transgress the law, they cannot be pardoned. So God cannot be just, maintain justice, and still pardon the sinner. This is what he claims. Every sin must meet its punishment, urge Satan, and if God should remit the punishment of sin or forgive, he would not be a good God of truth and justice. These are the charges of Satan, uttered in the past and still valid, still pronounced. Now, how will God respond to the charges? God cannot use deceit and deception and lies and force. So God has to use different ways. How to clear his character to vindicate his government. What will God do? What do you think? <laughs> That's a good question. You see, I mentioned that, that in my previous presentation, when Satan, Lucifer, laid charges against God and his government, he lied. And if somebody accuses you, lying against you, and telling that you are a liar, the only thing you cannot do, you cannot say, I'm not. If somebody tells you you're lying, you cannot say, I am not. You have to give other evidence that you are not. So God has to produce other evidence about his true nature and government. Matrix and Prophets, page 338. Now look, look at this, what God will do, how he responds. From the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character and to excite rebellion against his law. And this work appears to be crowned, his, crowned with success. The multitudes give ear to Satan's deceptions and set themselves against God. But... Amid the working of evil, God's purposes move steadily forward to their accomplishment. To all created intelligences, he is making manifest his justice and benevolence. So God has a plan, and God is making manifest his benevolence and his justice. Through Satan's temptations, the whole human race have been become transgressors of God's law, but by the sacrifice of his son, a way is open whereby they may, be ret may return to God. Through the grace of Christ, they may be enabled to render obedience to the Father's law. Thus, in every age, 
from the midst of apostasy and rebellion, God gathers out a people that are true to him, a people in whose heart is his law. So what is God doing? Man has sinned, deserved death. But now God intervenes and makes a plan of salvation, plan of redemption, how man can be rescued. And that rescued man how has a duty or a role to manifest God's true character. You understand? That's the plan of salvation. We often think about plan of salvation just we being saved. But this is not the only, even the main purpose of plan of salvation. Plan of salvation is to save the whole universe from evil. To save us, but to save other created beings that everyone can see that Satan is a liar and murderer and that God is just and fair and true. And now what God does, God creates a new distinct order of creation. It's a mysterious word. I don't fully understand what Sister White meant, spiritual prophecy meant, when she said when God created, created this world, earth, and human race, there was a special purpose in God's plan. Look at this statement, Rivian Herald, February 11, 1902. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. I don't understand exactly what this means. <laughs> Something profound. Whether because we can procreate or something else. Or some development, which we'll see. Man has a potential to grow and to develop. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. Brethren, doesn't that fill your heart with joy? And gratitude that we are made in God's image and God has an ama amazing purpose for us when he created us. Amen. That's amazing revelation for me. There is a purpose why I live, why you live. That we reflect the image of God. And look in education page 15, what, what is God's plan? When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness of his maker. Look, physical, mental, and spiritual. I don't want to anthropomorphize God to make him like us. But there is something, something that we are similar to him in many ways. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image, the more fully reflect the glory of the Creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. Vast was the scope offered for the, their exercise. Glorious the field open to their research. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, invited man's study. Face-to-face, heart-to-heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge to discover fresh springs of happiness and to obtain clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation more and more fully, have reflected the Creator's glory. That is fascinating. Opportunities for human beings. You know, we are not like Mormons. Mormons believe that men can become godlike. I mean, in terms of semi God. We don't believe that. We will always be creatures, but with infinite potential for development. Wow. This is why there is a, such a great controversy going on here, because much is at stake. Much is at stake. The whole universe is watching what's going on here. I, I quote two Bible texts, Isaiah 43, verse 7 and 10. 
Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Now, brethren, I'd like now to bring you from this celestial glory, this divine plan, I'd like you to bring to here and now, to our time and our society where we live. And I'd like to make a connection to see how the great controversy is going on right now in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, Asia, South America, wherever you go, Australia. It's in progress. How is Satan working today to destroy God's plan, God's character, and God's government, and God's law, his values? How is this happening today? Let me give you a basic statement. Where do values come from? Values. Moral values. Where do they come from? I'm asking you the question. From who? From God. God is the moral center of the universe. Okay, now let us come to us. If you ask in a public forum, people, general population of the society, the question, are the human beings basically good or evil, bad? What people would say? People will say, yeah, we are basically good. We are basically good. When you ask that question and get the answer, you immediately know if person who tells you people are basically good, you know these are secular humanist view, typically leftist view. And I will see what are the consequences of this view. Biblical Judeo-Christian view of man, that man is a fallen being, Basically, bad. It's a very important distinction that we have to make. Now, we who come from Judeo-Christian background, we may have our internal theological differences. But today I would like to talk about fundamentals, not about differences. Fundamentals, because the foundations of the society are today in question. Many people don't realize what's going on. This is extremely serious business, what's going on. So God gives us rights, not DNA, not biology. Rights come from God, from the creator. Biology doesn't give you rights. Biology, evolutionary biologists believe, knows only for the blind forces. You know, random mutations. Survival of the fittest, that's biology, how we are told. Now, I'll give you a moral test, which I have heard from other people who are going in public, who, who share our fundamental views and who are testing the public opinion. Now, they're giving a test to young people in going to the school and saying, look, in the, in the ocean, at the same time, a man is drowning, and the dog is drown drowning. And now he's asking school children, who would you say first, a man or dog? In secular schools, public school system, one third of the children say they would save man, one third they would say save dog, one third say they don't know who they would, who they would save first. Two thirds would not save the man first. You go to a Christian school and you ask the same questions. All children, without exception, say men say first. Do you understand the implications? I'll give you another example. In San Francisco, the city council a few years ago was debating the issue whether to allow public nudity 
or not. And the vote was very close, seven to eight. Just by one vote, they voted to prohibit public nudity. And do you know what reason, moral or ground, they gave for, to prohibit public nudity? Because it is not sanitary. If people sit on the bench, you know, naked and so on, so they have to carry a towel or something like that. Now I'm asking the question, what moral ground a secular humanist man can have against public nudity? None. What a Christian, people coming from Judeo-Christian background can say about that? What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? What happened? They were naked. What did God do with the man when he was naked? He covered him. Where do they get their morality? Brethren, this is disastrous. This is very scary where, where society is going. People are destroying the very foundations of morality. And please, don't take me wrong. I'm not taking political side. I'm not talking about left or right politically. I'm talking about principles. Not everything what religious right is doing is right or left is doing is bad. But I'm talking about principles, moral principles. And I'll tell you two things that contributed very much to this um, enfeeblement of the mind in the Western you know, society and civilizations and the enfeebled moral intellectual decline of the West are first the television. Television was really having very destructive influence on people's mind, especially after the Second World War. You know, some people say, well, but there is something good in, in TV. And I admit, yeah, there are some good things. But you know, this argument is not fully valid. This is like you would argue about the person who raped three ladies and killed two people, and you know, there is something good in him. Of course, there was something good in Hitler and Stalin. But when you take totality, that is moral bankruptcy. Totality is moral bankruptcy. So you see, television had a very negative influence spreading this worldview, humanist secular worldview, and immorality, destroying the moral fabric of the society. The second thing, you might be surprised, is a widespread college attendance. I have nothing against education, against colleges and universities, but we have a problem with the program offered at these secular colleges and universities. And I, I'll tell you why. I listened to one Jewish man who is a radio talk show host, and I will not mention his name. I don't want to give you know, a particular, you know, um, I mean, and not that I'm stealing thoughts. I will tell you privately, but not publicly. He said, I'm talking on the radio. And when people who call in say something very stupid, I ask them the question, which graduate school did you attend? And they respond, how, did you, how do you know that I attended a graduate school? You know, we're pleasantly surprised. He said, in answer to them, I mean, um, please, uh, I don't mean to insult you, but only a person who attended a graduate school can say something so stupid and foolish. Not that education is evil per se, but people are educated into imbecility. In the way of reasoning is completely false. And especially if they are coming you know, from liberal arts. The same author said, and I agree with him, my grandmother, who didn't finish the elementary school, knew more about men and women and their relations than people who have PhD in women's studies today. It's a shame how people think about, you know, Gender and, and sex and all these things today. So, I'll give you one illustration. A young man is sitting at home at the family table and talking to his father, mother. And he is arguing about some moral values. And he says to his dad, Dad, but you did not, didn't go to college. 
You don't know. Now look at the paradox. Father is spending a lot of money to school his child, and the child is turning against him, you know, alienating his own son through education. Isn't that the paradox of the modern society? So, these two developments have been horrific. Modern liberal art in humanities in the West is fully under control of godless, secular, humanist gurus who have poisoned the minds of souls and souls of millions of young people. Now, I'm not telling you don't go to university or to college, but be aware of this. Be aware of this. Why is it that young people born raised in good Christian homes go to college and they suddenly lose faith like a killing field? What's happened? It's not by chance, because they're exposed to these devastating teachings of the modern society and culture. So in a way, we can be pessimist, because traditional West is losing. US is trailing the secular Western Europe by a generation. Western Europe almost completely lost. You go there, people don't go to churches anymore, and you know, they don't talk about this. Judeo-Christian values thrown through the window. Our duty as a church is to clarify the consequences of human moral choices or values. Biblical thought has consequences in real life. If you believe that people are basically good, then you don't blame the evil on the doer, but on the outside forces or circumstances. If you have a good machine, basically good machine, which is malfunctioning, so there must be something external to the machine that is causing it to malfunction, right? And evil comes naturally. So the question is, is this, but if we are not basically good and evil comes naturally, then evil will not surprise you, but the good would surprise you. Evil is, evil is pretty ubiquitous. What needs to be studied is his goodness. Why Nazis kill, uh, kill the Jews doesn't surprise me. But why some Gentiles, non-Jews, risk their own lives and the lives of their family members to save the members of a foreign group, this surprises me. Does it surprise you? Why people did good when everyone was doing bad? That's the question that we should ask today. So, and that Jewish man, he said, what I'm surprised when I ask my fellow Jewish people what they believe about human beings, he said, oh, people are basically good. He said, he is coming, descendant of the people who were killed in Auschwitz, millions. And he says, oh, people are basically good. <laughs> See, tragedy. Tragedy, difficult to understand. So why do not study, why we do not study goodness? Because we assume it is natural. We do not study why people breathe well, we study why lungs fail. And that's a paradox in medical sciences and health sciences. People are going to the medical schools, spending years. We just spoke last night, how about how many years people spent, you know, to complete the medical, to have a medical degree. You go to undergraduate school, then you go four years in a graduate school, medical school, then you have residency, almost 10 years. And people study pathology and pathophysiology and oncology and pharmacology, and the physicians study very little how to pre prevent disease. <laughs> about goodness, study about pathology or evil. Why not study goodness? What can we do to preserve health? Thankfully, little by little, it's trickling in in their, in their you know, curriculum. So there are probably half a million books on evil. I don't know if there are a thousand books on good. You're aware of that? And the ramifications are really huge. And this principle applies to individual and to family, and to, this principle applies to a nation. Let me tell you something about United States, an example. What has made United States a great nation? Have you thought about that? 
This is not studied in the curriculum in many universities. You just take a US coin and what do you read there? What, do you, what kind of inscription is there? Liberty, in God we trust, a pluribus unum. This is US Trinity. This is what made the United States a great nation. There is a value system expressed on the coin. Liberty, in God we trust, a pluribus unum, which means out of many one. French people, after the French Revolution, they have a similar trinity, but not exactly the same. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Liberty, equality, and brotherhood. But you see, there is a little difference between egality, egalitarianism, and liberty. If you want to strictly implement egalitarianism, you can infringe upon the liberty. Yes, we need equal pay for equal work, regardless of the gender. But in some areas, you cannot be completely equal. There are natural differences that have to be respected, otherwise liberty will be infringed. And what we have today, what is a dangerous trend in the United States, in the, in the West, we are having egalitarianism versus liberty, we have godless secular world versus in God we trust. And we have multiculturalism versus a pluribus unum. I'm not against multiculturalism in terms if people agree on basic values. But if you bring in the country people who have completely different values and who do not subscribe to these values that made the United States great, what you will get ultimately. Do you understand? I'll just take one example. Islam. Islam is basically, not now attacking Islam as a religion, but one aspect of Islam is simply they are theocratic societies. The government or the society is governed by Sharia law. There is no separation of church and state. You understand that? You go to some of these countries and see about human rights. So if people don't change the value system, they cannot integrate properly in this country which respects these foundations. I hope we agree on that. And the leftists or these secularists, they dismiss the religious and, as humans, labeling them, one gentleman called it six herb, sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, racist, bigoted. This is what they tell you. If you advocate these values. But I'll tell you, coming back to the spiritual aspect of the whole story. One reason for the ascendancy of leftism and the secularism is because it is based on heart. Based on heart. And the heart and the eyes are the worst guides to proper behavior. I'll tell you why. Young people and everyone, you can have beautiful young men and women, very attractive, appealing to the eye, who can be very, very evil and corrupt inside. Do you agree with me? Very. So don't go by the eyes. I remember when I was a young man, there was an older gentleman in my town who told me, look, when you look for a wife, don't go by eyes, go by ears. Go <laughs> by ears. But today, we call it eye candy. You heard about eye candy? Yes. <laughs> you don't have ear candy, but there is an eye candy. So the battle today is the standards versus heart. Moral standards versus heart. I'll give you the perfect example. Same-sex marriage. And you know how it works. People love each other. How can you say no? People love each other. How, how can you go against it? Do you understand? So does it mean 
that we will allow our hearts to redefine the most important institution in the society for the first time in history of civilization. Shall we go by our heart? That's a question. My heart dictates personal behavior toward the gay people, who may happen to be people we know or who are related to us. We can still be loving and kind to them, but we cannot approve that lifestyle or same-sex marriage. You understand? We love people, God loves people, but we cannot approve wrong behavior. And also, brethren, please, there is something very interesting here. There is an, no emotional blackmail that exists in a lot of families where there is a gay child. So the young child who is a gay, who can say to the parent, you know, if you do not agree with redefining the marriage, I don't talk to you, mom. I don't talk to you, dad. You heard about that? So the children are engaged in emotional blackmail. And the parents should say, you know, it's obvious. You do not love me. I love you despite your position on the same-sex marriage. But you cannot love me despite my position? Then clearly you have never loved me. So I love you despite your position. But you don't love me because of my position? This is emotional blackmail. And brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, this applies broader than just same-sex marriage. Unbiblical marriages. We love each other. <coughs> so has God something to say about my marriage? What do you think? Yes, we love people who have entered into unbiblical marriages, but we cannot approve it. And we have to have moral courage to show the way and to say where we stand. But parents that are so afraid of their children today, they are usually do not have courage to say it. And these are all hard standards. I get my values from the book called the Bible. But if you do not get your values from the divinely inspired book, where do you get your values from? And you know the answer, the heart. The people admit it. Again, another case, gentleman telling me, interviewing a Swedish PhD students, very bright, smart, fluent in English. He's asking him the question, do you, do you believe in God? Not. Do you have any religion? Of course not. So, where do you get your notions of right and wrong? My heart. My heart. That's the answer. So our task today, brothers and sisters, our mission is to affirm the eternal perfect standards established by loving and all-wise God. These standards are, the, are there to make us more loving, more compassionate, more just than if we were guided by heart. Therefore, dear brethren, dear young people, there is a work for you to do in this modern society. We are called to be light in the world, the witnesses for God in the world that is filled with moral darkness and great confusion. We call this confusion, there is one word, Babylon. It encompasses the whole complex of evil that exists in the world today. Now, let me just briefly tell you. I take the Bible for moral guidance and for wisdom, and I'm not ashamed of that. If you go to secular universities and colleges, you will often hear, learn nothing about the Bible except that it is irrelevant, outdated, and frequently immoral. I say this because there is nothing, not any religious or secular body of work, that comes close to the Bible, informing the moral basis of the Western civilization and therefore of nearly all moral progress in the world. This is not now putting one race above other. I'm talking about Judeo-Christian religion. is superior to any other religion in the world without any question, any doubt. It was this book that guided every one of the founding fathers of the United States, including those described as deists. In, it is 
the book that formed the foundational values of every major American university. Harvard University, Yale University started as Christian schools founded by Christian men and women. It is the book from which every morally great American from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln to Dr. Martin Luther King got his values. Every great American got his values from the Bible. It is, the, this, it is this book that gave humanity the Ten Commandments, the greatest moral code ever devised. It not only codified the essential moral rules for society, it announced that the creator of the universe stands behind them, demands them, and judges humans' compliance with them. And I'm very grateful that Seventh-day Adventists keep all the Ten Commandments in original format, all ten, including the fourth, which declares the Sabbath commandment, who is the lawgiver, who is the creator. It gave humanity the great moral rule, rule, love your neighbor as yourself. It taught humanity the unprecedented and unparalleled concept that all human beings are created equal because all human beings of every race, ethnicity, nationality, and both male and female are created in God's image. That comes from the Bible. Fundamental human rights, brothers and sisters, are known only in the Judeo-Christian religion. You don't have them anywhere else, and they come from the Bible. It taught people not to trust the human heart, but to be guided by moral law, even when the heart pulled in different direction. This is the book that taught humanity that human sacrifice is abomination. In ancient religions, you have human sacrifices everywhere. South America, Africa, Asia. Judeo-Christian religion has no human sacrifices. This is the book that desexualized God, a first in human history. You go to ancient Greece, to ancient Rome, you're having you know, male and female deities. In the Bible, God is desexualized. It is the book that alone launched humanity on the long road to abolish slavery. This is the Bible. I will not speak more on that. And it was the book that taught people the wisdom of Job and Ecclesiastes, unparalleled masterpieces of world literature, wisdom literature. Without this book, there would be, have no Western civilization, Western science, Western human rights, abolitionist movement, United States, the freest, most prosperous, opportunity-giving society that was formed. And you know, in the spirit of prophecy, great controversy, God blessed the United States because of these principles. We are concerned where the states are going right now. Now, brethren, I, I don't have to go. I mean, if you talk just the music, music, just take a music. If you go to Japan, you know which music is played there? Bach. Bach. The most famous collection of Bach's cantatas are issued by Masaki Suzuki and are all sang by Japanese singers. Why? I'm taking my children to the piano classes, to a good piano teacher. I see Chinese moms bringing their children there, right? Playing classical music, Western, yeah? You agree with that? Not that Japanese don't have a good music of their own or other nations, even from where I'm coming from, whatsoever. But you see, the apex, the highest, produced a Judeo-Christian religion. Greatest art, monotheism. There have been good people and bad people both in East and the West and South and North. I'm not saying that. Bad and good people have been. But when we talk about the good that was, was produced, we have not to be ashamed of the Bible. Bible has given to the society, human society, the greatest things that we have today. And let me just say one more thing. The framers of the United States Constitution, they were not stupid when they were making US Constitution, and they knew that Constitution alone as a legal act is not sufficient to protect United States forever prosperity and freedom and peace. Look what John Adams, the second president of the United States and the first vice president together with John, um, George Washington, what he wrote. I quote, 
We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. What did he believe at human nature? He was thinking, he, he believed that human nature is bad. So we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Morality and religion have to, to restrain human passions. So, so they understood human nature. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution is designed only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate for any other. What do you say about this? I'm, amen. Men understood that constitution as a legal framework is not sufficient without human beings, public servants, civil servants, who are moral and religious people. Because, and we see today what's happening in the US, unfortunately. That elected representatives are not serving the people, but they are serving the lobbyists. I don't want to go into politics, but you know what's going on. Corruption, a lot of corruption. The great seal of the United States, Jefferson and Franklin, who were deists, had designed. And you know what is the motive? The exodus of Jews from Egypt. That is on the great seal of the United States. They understood this new nation, United States, and as a new, new beginning. They wanted to create you know, good society based on biblical moral values. I have to finish. Brethren, why we do not trust our heart? Why we don't trust our heart? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 79. Jesus, the great physician, lists the grim symptoms of this disease. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Matthew 15, 19. Our hearts were never designed to be followed, but to be led. If we make our hearts gods and ask them to lead us, they will lead us to narcissistic misery and ultimately damnation. Therefore, don't believe in your heart. Direct your heart to believe in God. Don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. Know that Jesus did not say to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled, just believe in your hearts. What did he say? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, and I'm coming to conclusion. We have a duty in this world as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists. What is our job? To be light in the world. Young people, don't be ashamed don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of the Bible. This holy book is full of wisdom for your life here in this earth and for eternity. I'd like to mention just one case. The question that the journalist directed to Tiger Woods. You know Tiger Woods had a problem in his life? And I'm not using this to, to, to demean him, to humiliate him. This is a very common problem. They ask him, how could you lie to so many for so long? And you know what was his answer? Because I first lied to myself. And Ravi Zacharias, a well-known Christian apologist, he said, I would have, I, I like if I could have asked him another question, follow-up question. What did you lie to yourself about? Did you lie to yourself that you would never get caught? Or did you lie to yourself about the fact that in doing what you did, there lies your happiness? You understand? What did you lie to yourself about? That you will not get caught? Or that what you were doing will bring you to happiness? Yeah, or both. That is a deadly lie, less significant, you know. 
But the real poisonous lie in the system is the lie that you can violate the sacred boundaries that God has set and that in that violation you will find your fulfillment and your happiness. It is simply not true. God set the boundaries. He set our benefits. He set for our benefits these fences. A well-known uh, apologist Chesterton said, once said, whenever you remove any fence, always pause long enough to ask why was it put there in the first place. If you move a fence, pause and ask yourself why it was put there in the first place. And for us, brethren, let me leave you with this thought. A Jewish rabbi was asked the question, what is the greatest evil that human beings can commit? And you know what he said, and I tend to agree with him. He said, violating the third commandment, thou shalt not carry, translation of the third commandment, thou shalt not carry God's name in vain. When people take God's name and do evil things. This is the worst crime. Zavi Zakaria said at, uh, after one lecture, he is a well-known public apologist and traveling to many universities and so on, and he was giving a lecture in one hall, and his host was taking him to the airport after this visit, and they were talking. And that gentleman who was taking him to the airport told him the following thing. He said, look, I want to tell you my wife invited um, a friend who is a physician, a medical doctor, a lady, who attended the lectures. And she said, the lecture was fascinating, a beautiful lecture. But I have a question. I'm wondering that speaker, what is he like in his private life? You understand? This is the question that people are asking today, Christians. What are they like in their private life? Their true self. And this is what heaven is waiting for. God is waiting for people who will represent him faithfully that God's name will not be taken in vain. May we be among these people. Amen. Thank you, Brother Walter, for this wonderful sermon. We have a big privilege. We have Bible, and uh, we should really take advantage of that. Uh, in our closing, we will sing hymn number 381. 381. Please rise.
Bill Neal down for closing prayer, and Brother Walter will lead us. Loving and gracious Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for creating us in your image. Thank you for giving us intellectual powers and moral abilities to know what is right and wrong. Thank you for saving us when we have fallen and sending your son Jesus Christ to give his life that we would have another chance. Thank you for revealing yourself in the Holy Word and in the works of creation. Thank you for brothers and sisters and friends of our church who are assembled here and those who join us through the internet. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship. We thank you for the truth you have revealed to us and for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for thy laws, eternal, eternal moral laws, that we can know them. These are precious fences that protect our liberties, like a good laws of the land, good constitution that protect the freedoms and peace and order in the society. Oh, Father, help us not to be ashamed of the Bible, not to be ashamed of you, of thy law, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to defend boldly, firmly, but humbly the truth in this age of darkness. When everything is relative, there are no absolutes. The very foundations of the society are being eroded and destroyed. Father, give us power that we may defend your character and your government and that we can prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the great controversy, that your name, your government will be vindicated through us, that people can see in us that we are your true followers. Forgive us wherever we have failed you or each other. Give us peace in the remaining and blessed hours of the Sabbath day. Bless our fellowship, Lord, and let us be focused on you and your glory. Forgive us our sins. We ask all this and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We came to the end of our divine service. Uh, we will be dismissed. Uh, we will go downstairs and we will have fellowship lunch. Uh, remember, we don't have to push those people in the kitchen, give them time and be respectful and uh, blessed. Remind of the day, Sabbath day.